Okay. My name is uh, Paul Baudet. I'm past president of the Environment Council of Rhode Island. Um, thank you for the opportunity to address you this afternoon. Um, the council represents over 60 organizations across the state. Each organization can speak to their own issues on any piece of uh, legislation, like Mr. Uh, like Jerry Elmer did. Um, and I'll speak to that in a moment and further in my testimony. Um, but this piece of legislation is a priority bill for us, which means it is very high on our legislative agenda. We feel that it is critical to the betterment of the environment of Rhode Island. Sitting here all afternoon, hearing the dialogue and the conflicts on the bill being um, the referendum and the EFSB and then all the other issues that have come up that aren't germane specific to the writing of the bill but are being brought up. Um, in terms of the referendum, uh, we feel we support that because it does give the people of the, of the town of Boroughville the right to say what they need to say on the, on the legislation and on the tax treaty. And hearing the pros and cons on what would happen across the state, um, I think you have a unique opportunity today to consider a message of fairness to all people in, in the 39 cities and towns of the state of Rhode Island. If their town council or their city administrations are not listening to them correctly, the people have a voice to you to say, help. Tell my town council, tell my city people, we need to be heard. This letter that you see in front of you, many of you are lawyers. I've never known of a document that's being portrayed the way it is today that is undated, unsigned, but taken 100 percent for its veracity. I ask you, why should that be allowed? Why was it not dead on arrival just because it had the letterhead on it? Um, and that is what these people are saying. Senator Boy, you have a question? Yeah, I just want to correct you. I think we're questioning that, and we're not taking it. I, 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 don't, I don't accept that as a member of this committee, that that's, it's not signed, it's not dated in the committee, at least for I, myself. I it. It, I, I'm not portrayed. accepting that as being gospel here. In fact, what we heard from the uh, company is that the actual... Um, negotiations are not complete yet. Correct. So I don't think they should have even issued that, knowing that there's, there's a, a non-completion yet. So, But I want to just follow up on one thing, because there was a comment made, and you, you have hit on an issue of um, courage and leadership, I think, of this body, and whether we want to have some courage and leadership. And my good friend, Senator Fogarty, and Rep. Keeble, I think, have demonstrated um, a lot of courage and leadership on this issue, um, and they ought to be commended. But um, Mr. Beretta, who I respect tremendously, said you can't change the rules now. The game has already started. You can't change the rules. Um, I think my comment has to come from what Mr. Sanapi just said before. I, don't, I think he left. But he said 50 years ago they did something out in Warwick and no one listened to the people in Warwick. So I guess it was wrong back then that they didn't have access maybe to the assembly to come here and ask the General Assembly to do something about it. Maybe they should have done something about it back then, but they didn't. So I agree with you. We have an opportunity to make this a fair process now. And that's, I think, what the bill is all about. And I think if we stick to the issue of what's fair for the residents of the town and what's also fair for the companies involved in the council. I mean, I can't speak for the company, but my comment would be I would think that if the company wants to have a good marriage with the council and with the residents, more so the residents of that town, then they should want everything to be open and public with those residents, make sure the residents are happy with the deal, and maybe it would work. I think you people understand that power. That line is there. That's where the line happens to be in Boroughville. I think if we... So we all understand that. We also understand that if... We're concerned about energy, even renewable energy. Um, to take this project somewhere else, the infrastructure cost would be phenomenal. And then that has an effect on the whole state as well. 
So in some ways you have an opportunity, I think, as a community to be a, a, a set a precedent here. But I think that I agree with you. The process has to be very fair, open, and everybody has to be happy with the end result. And I think you get it by way of what Senator Fogarty is talking about. I'm sorry I interrupted you. No, I agree with you, Senator. Um, the, the idea of and the legal side of how the referendum fits and what it means to the state constitution and everything, uh, I, that is – as the old saying goes, that is well above my pay grade. Um, but I will address the other question on the EFSB. Um, I think the section on the EFSB, and this is where Jerry's comment that Mr. Lom Senator Lombardi commented about, if, if that's a problem, strip it. Um, we would say that would be the last thing to do, but if it was a fail-safe and to get the bill passed, perhaps. But inclusion or expansion of the EFSB is a very wise thing to do. Um, it brings people to the table with expertise that have an ability to speak and act. Yes, the EFSB and DEM and PUC can ask for information. Let me give you an example, if I can just step out of my role as president of, of the council. I also sit on the Coastal Resources Council of Rhode Island. And when new information comes up, we are given that information to review. When new people come up, and I, when I was seated on, on the council, I was given volumes of material to, to learn, and I was trained in it. And then every two weeks, I get a tome of paperwork on the ascents. And people that step up to these positions so someone is added, for example, on the Water Resources Board. That is a critical piece to be on that, on that EFSB. Those people have expertise. It's not just a matter that they speak to the issue. It's a matter that they can then vote their, their side of the issue. I sit, I listen. You three senators come before me at the council meeting, and you all tell me all the important things, and it's up to me to value one, two, three, and how much I want to put value in the big picture. But if you're sitting at the board, you now can have a direct input on the decision. That is critical. And on the water side, it is truly critical. In Rhode Island, we are blessed with foresight many years ago of a fantastic water system that supplies 60 percent of our state. It needs to be protected. It needs to be monitored. And that has to be watched. And just as, uh, and it cannot be sold. <laughs> I know that's not part of this, but uh, water is, is a God-given right to everyone. And we need to be able to give it to everyone cleanly. Except for one point, and I appreciate, and, and, but I'm, I was really troubled with the way Mr. Elmer summarily just just throw out the composition issue it's not a factor and so uh, you know someone who's such an advocate for the position that you espouse was rather quick to summarily wipe out the first phase of this bill so I while I applaud what you're saying I, I question what the true motive is behind this bill when you've got someone of his stature saying and we all heard it, and I know Senator Conley I, heard it. I definitely heard it. No, he, that, is, that is CLF's you position. Know, and, you know, I, and, and so that, that was troubling to me. I, I could understand that from your point of view. Um, that speaks to what I said earlier, Senator. The council is made up of many organizations, but every member can speak and act on their own. CLF in Rhode Island is part of a larger CLF in New England, et cetera, et cetera. And trust me, I don't know what those dynamics are. But I trust Jerry when he talks about the energy issues because he can talk – he can give you more information than I think most people know in, in, in many weeks. Um, so the expansion and, and, and all of that, um, it would not – by putting new members on the EFSB, it would not delay the process. 
I think it was Mr. Ryan that said, would you please put in something that would grandfather us? Well, that's a great idea. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that idea. However, if you, if someone is put onto the EFSB, that doesn't mean that they're not going to do their homework, as I was just explaining for the Coastal Council. That person will be educated. Right now, the PUC um, has a new person uh, being added. Does that mean that they either, A, cannot vote, or B, the process has to start over when that new person gets elected or put on the board. Uh, it, it's, that's not how government works. You know that. I know that. Um, the process would not be hurt um, and, and would not be killed or slowed down by doing it. Um, uh, so the last comment, of, going back to Senator Jabor's questions earlier throughout the first part of the hearings and just recently on the resilient Rhode Island, um, I feel that the answer was very, very, very soft in terms of what it does to Rhode Island. How does this plant um, get to the resilient Rhode Island goals? And how does it meet those, those, those goals or standards? And it was referenced that when it goes on, um, it would be chosen before a coal-fired plant in Connecticut or anywhere else. Well, there's only one coal-fired plant left in Connecticut, and it is being shut down as we speak. It is being replaced by a new fossil fuel plant. And so will it be up before? I don't know what that process is. I'm not involved in the Connecticut side of the issue, but I do know that the last Connecticut, the last coal-fired plant, so it's kind of like saying, well, you, they won't use that. Well, it's not going to be used. And, and so where is the justification there? It just doesn't make sense. It's, it's, a, it's a shell game. Um, and what are the emissions of this plant? Yes, fossil fuels are bad. We have to look at the CO2 that we are um, emitting. The Resilient Rhode Island Act set standards and goals not mandatory. But they were, the, they were a statement, and a great statement by this body, the Senate body, and the whole state of Rhode Island, and said, this is what we will do. And now this first big plant comes along, and we say, eh, maybe not. Um, natural gas, methane, is 20 times more potent than CO2. And when burned, it does give off CO2. Are there emission leaks? We know there are. All the gas lines uh, leaks methane, and, and that is dangerous. Um, and the power plant will be brought online, and it can be brought up online within an hour and use uh, methane, natural gas. Then there was no explanation of why they have 2 million gallons of oil that, that is stored for emergency reasons. I, I'm, I'm not saying that they're going to use it all the time, but I'm just saying if it's, if it's that efficient, then, I mean, I know they need a plan B, but are they losing their oil? Um, <clears throat> I'd just like to ask you a question. I think everybody um, that testifies had their own little pocket of knowledge, but you seem to really be focusing on some of the issues. Um, if you know, and I don't really know, and I trust the representation made by Mr. Beretta and his counsel, who are credible individuals, that this type of plant is something that IOC likes, cherishes, and these are the type of plants. And I would imagine that if they do create renewable energy, which, by the way, also provides a lot of good, high-paying jobs if you're in the renewable energy issue of looking for work, it's the they, fastest growing, fastest growing, and they provide in, jobs. So th Rhode those Island are jobs that Rhode Island would be looking for. What I haven't seen, or if somebody can answer this, has IOC actually said this plant is needed in Rhode Island? I'm not that familiar with that process. Um, all I can say is that in February, when the bids were given. The plant asked for a thousand, and were granted 485 as what the ISO felt was needed from the plant when it goes online in Rhode Island. 
I mean, that's that's the reading that I take from it. Okay, because I... If, if, if Burrowville is, unless I'm missing something, if Burrowville Town Council is negotiating a tax treaty, wouldn't we already know whether or not EFSB is determined that this is a proper site for that facility? No. We would the, not know that yet. The EF, EFSB has not made their ruling yet. They're still in the hearing process. Okay. And, but the town is negotiating, as I understand it, with contingent the Contingent upon that. Okay. Contingent that when everything – and my understanding is companies can go about this in two ways. They could go ahead and try to get all, as you're pointing out, all their ducks in a row and then go for the permits that would give them their paybacks um, when they sell the energy. Or, as Invenergy did this time, they went and bid in February to get their payments and then go after the permits and hope they meet their deadline. It's One process is not worse than the other, but it's just a matter of which way they wanted to go, and they made that choice. And that was my understanding. So just in closing, um, you know, I would – Go back to one question on, um, I think it was Senator Connolly that asked it, or maybe it was a question to, that, that came up about the three-person EFSB board is really the con consent and advice of the Senate and, and what happens on, on rulings. Um, all three people are, this is, this is totally off the side, but just something to think about. Um, they're all by the governor. I mean, it's they're appointed by the governor, the DEM director, the, and the people are governor's people. And so, where does the, the Senate have a right to say? I guess you have a right to say when it when they get appointed, but um, just something to, to consider. It's the it's, it really comes down to CO2. Um, how much CO2 are we going to put up? The Resilient Rhode Island Act stated we have goals, and we're not going to meet them. Professor Timmons Roberts is an internationally respected individual. He testified and worked in Paris on, on the goals. Um, and when he says that this plant is going to keep us from doing this, we'll never meet our goals. And whatever we try, it's just it's not going to happen. And I know that's not part of this legislation, but it is being discussed. And I feel I must say it cannot go unanswered. Thank you very much. Thank you. Are there any other questions or comments for this witness?